Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the um, CTSI Research Boot Camp Fall Series on blending qualitative and quantitative methods in health research. Um, today's presentation by Dr. Danielle um, Davidoff is asking the right questions, designing and conducting um, successful interviews and focus groups. Um, Danielle completed her um, BA in psychology with a minor in biology from Marshall University in 2006, and then earned her PhD in public health sciences in 2010 from West Virginia University. Um, she has been an assistant professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at West Virginia University for three years. She holds a secondary appointment in the WU School of Public Health Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences, where she teaches intervention design and qualitative research methods. Um, Danielle's research is in the area of intimate partner and sexual violence. As a CTSI research scholar, She's receiving funding for her work, as well as mentorship and training in dissemination and implementation science with the ultimate goal of translating violence prevention and intervention programs into rural Appalachian populations. So, Danielle. All right, so um, two weeks ago I gave um, kind of a primer lecture on qualitative research methods. And then today, um, I've been asked to do a little bit more of an in-depth discussion on one really specific area of qualitative research, which is doing interviews and focus groups. Um, so today might be a little bit more applied. If you have questions as I'm going through, please feel free to, to interrupt me. That's completely fine. I hope that this um, provides a good overview. And I hope to, I'll give you some resources at the end if you want to um, look for anything I've discussed more in depth. Um, so today I'm going to break this talk up into two little sections. The first thing I'm going to do is talk about um, interviews and focus groups, how we design those and set up, and everything that we need to keep in mind before we do this kind of research. Um, and then the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about how we craft interview questions and how when we're actually in the process of interviewing, how we can do that um, in the best way possible. So that's kind of the, the during the interview phase. Um, so why do we interview? Well, we interview when we want to capture information from people that we can't directly observe or that we can't really get from a quantitative survey. Um, and so things that are really appropriate for qualitative interviewing are anytime we want to capture a patient or a participant's um, thoughts, feelings, perspectives, their experiences or behaviors that they engage in, um, or anytime we want to learn more about how people assign meaning to the world around them or the experiences they've had, qualitative interviewing is a really good option. Um, and so we have to really enter into the other person's perspective. And so it, it requires a lot more work and a lot different work than if we're doing a survey. Um, and so the good news or the bad news, depending on how you want to look at it, is that qualitative interviewing um, is largely dependent upon the interview, the interviewer. So how the quality of the data that you get at the end of the day um, is mostly, it mostly depends on us as researchers or whoever we hire to help uh, collect this data. And so that can be a bad thing because that means if you do 10 interviews and you get your data back and it's really not what you were looking for, it's not really most of the time the participant's fault. It's usually uh, our research, the researcher's fault or our interviewer's fault. Um, we have to do a much better job of, of changing how we usually do research where we are constantly um, interjecting our hypotheses into the, into the data and trying to get out certain answers. Instead, we need to become a little bit more patient and get into the art of hearing. Um, and I have a little no pressure um, picture up there because that, it, it is a lot of pressure. It is difficult to conduct interviews and to run focus groups with people. And it takes a lot of skill and a lot of practice. Um, and so I hope today to just provide kind of like an overview and some, set some ground rules. Um, and so to begin, I thought it might be helpful to do a little bit of a role play to show you maybe what, uh, how interviewing might, might go. Um, and so I'm going to pretend that I'm a researcher that's interested in um, pet ownership. And I'm interested in animals and pet ownership and that impact on an individual's health and wellness and well-being and stress. And so I'm a researcher. That's what I'm interested in doing. Um, and so maybe I'm going to do individual interviews with people who own pets and own animals and try to ask them, uh, you know, how, how that is in their life and how they... Um, how the pet might influence their well-being. So I have a volunteer today who's going to help out with um, 
with being a participant in my research study, and her name's Mindy. And she's going to come up and uh, let me interview her. And so I'm going to be the researcher that conducts this interview. Okay, so hi, hi there, Mindy. Um, I'm Danielle. Um, I haven't. I have to do these interviews for a grant that I have. Um, the topic I'm picking to do these interviews about is dog ownership and how good dog ownership is for health. Um, so since you have a dog, you're an ideal candidate for um, for an interview. Um, so I have some questions for you to answer today. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, um, so do you have a dog? Okay. Uh, what is your dog's name? Her name is Spice. Okay. And how long have you had this dog? Um, about two years. Okay. Is the dog black, brown, or tan? Uh, tan. Okay. Um, is the dog nice or is it mean? She's pretty friendly. Friendly. Okay. Okay. Does the dog make you happy? Yeah, of course. Okay. Good, good, good. Um, so do you think that your dog has a positive influence on your health and on your well-being? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that really does cover all of my questions that I had today. Um, thank you for doing this very much. Um, so I will, um, uh, you know, I had a gift card for you, but I forgot it. So can I email you or just call you to figure out how to get that to you? I guess. Okay. Sure. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. okay thank bye. you. Okay. You can for a second. So what do you guys think of that interview? Was that a good interview? No. I may as well have given her a survey and that probably would have done less damage. Uh, what, what was bad about that? It won't hurt my feelings. <laughs> What's that? Leading. Leading questions. So I kind of told her what I wanted to hear maybe. What else? I hope, yeah, I only asked questions that she could answer yes or no. What else was bad? I didn't have the gift card to pay her for her time. Yeah, that was a problem. Anything else bad? Personal information? Oh, yeah. I was kind of um, like distracted. I was looking at my interview guide. I wasn't really engaging with her. No notes. I wasn't taking any notes down or anything like that. Yeah, and it was very hurried. So I, I could have done a survey. Um, so we're going to try it again. And I'm going to try to not make those same mistakes this, with this follow up interview that I'm going to do. OK. Hi, Mindy. How are you? Good. My name's Danielle DeVito. Thank you so much for meeting me today. Um, well, getting off to a really good start here. Well, thank you so much for meeting me. I really appreciate your time. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a qualitative researcher at West Virginia University, and I have a, a really keen interest in studying pet ownership and, and how animals might influence people's health and well-being. Um, so there's a lot of research out there that's on this topic, and I'm, I'm really passionate about this study. So I'm really interested in dog ownership. And because on the initial survey that you filled out for us um, about a month ago, you indicated that you had a dog, we thought you would be a great person to talk to. And I certainly know how, how dog ownership affects me and affects those around me, but I'm clueless about how it affects, affects other people. So just really want to learn more about your experiences um, owning a dog. Mm -hmm. So uh, we already went over the consent form, and you were able to sign that. But I just want to make sure, do you have any questions about the consent process or anything? No. Okay, great. Well, if it's okay with you, then I'm going to take um, your verbal consent as your consent to participate in this research and go ahead and start our recorder. Um, I just don't want to miss anything. Um, everything you say is going to be completely um, disconnected from your name and confidential. Okay, well, great. So just to get started, can you tell me a little bit about your dog? Okay, my dog's name is Spice. She's seven, so she's kind of old, but I've had her for about two years. 
She was a puppy mill dog, but she's learning how to love. She lives life of luxury now in my house. Uh, she loves treats. She loves stealing my blankets, and she's got the cutest gray face. She's tan, okay. too, so she looks very old. Well, she sounds adorable. She is. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's great. So um, can you tell me a little bit about Spice's temperament? Well, since she's a pug, she's kind of pudgy and lazy. Uh, she sleeps a lot. I try and get her active, though, because she really likes to be outside in the grass. Okay. So, yeah, I like to take her outside. Okay, so how often would you say you take her outside? About three or four times. We have to limit her though, because pugs have really bad breathing. So okay. She can't run too much. Gotcha. Or okay. She just lays down. All right. Well, so it sounds like though you do get a chance to take her outside and enjoy the outdoors. Yeah. Would that be right? Yeah, I like spending time with her outside. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Great. So aside from being able to take her outside and take her on walks, um, how would you describe your relationship with Spice? Well. She's definitely really good in my life. She has a positive effect on just my health in general. I love coming home to her, and when I put my key in the door, she just starts barking. She runs down the stairs, and I hear her, and that makes me so happy. That's what I was looking forward to when I come home. So I like that a lot. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you said that you know it really makes you happy when you know, you know that someone's waiting at home for you and is yeah. excited. Can you yeah. just tell me a little bit more about that? Uh, I mean, a dog really depends on you. So going home to that and having her be so happy, I mean, you gotta love that face, right? It's pretty adorable, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's wonderful to hear. Yeah. I'm really glad that you have such a positive influence in yeah. your life. Um, if it's okay, I just kind of want to summarize what we've talked about today. Yeah, sure. Um, so you, you do have a, a dog. She's a pug. Her name is Spice. Yeah. She's seven, but um, you've had her for about two years, and you get to get outside and take her on walks and mm -hmm. do that a few times a day. Um, and then she sleeps quite a bit, but yeah. <laughs> when she's awake, she seems to really um, impact your mood and, and make you feel happy, and it's nice that someone or something um, is dependent upon you, and that may be a form of stress relief for you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so yeah. would you say that I, I interpreted what we talked about correctly? Yeah, of course. Okay, well, wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Um, if you have anything you want to sh share that additionally or add to, you can contact me. Um, my phone number is on my card there, and don't forget to take your gift card with you that's over there as well. Yes. Thank you so much for Thank coming you. today. I appreciate it. Yeah. Was that any better? Yeah? So what was different about that one? Thank you. What was different that time? Yeah. I was able to at least tell her um, why I cared about this topic other than, hi, let's get into the questions. Yeah. What other things did I do differently? Yeah. Yeah, so at the end I wrapped up to make sure I, I was taking away from the interview what she meant to tell me. Um, and we call that member checking. And it's really important to do that maybe at the end of interviews, during interviews, or even after we've completed our data collection, just to make sure we're, we're leaving um, with the same ideas that our participants meant to give us. Any other things that were different about that that may be important? Oh, member checking? Member, member checking. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the ins and outs of what you just observed and why some of the things that I did the first time around were really bad and why some of the things I did the second time around um, were, were much better and why it's important. Um, and so just if you didn't pick up on it, this here is Spice, the little pug that we were talking about. Um, she's pretty cute. And thank you to Mindy. Um, so I'm going to briefly outline the steps for qualitative interviewing. Um, and I'm not going to talk about each of these things in depth, but instead go in depth in certain ones and just touch briefly on other steps. Um, so the first step of any type of qualitative interview that you may need to do is to, to decide on what questions you want to ask very broadly. 
Um, so what areas? So I knew I was interested in this study in um, pet ownership and its impact on health, but how do I then craft that into a few really specific questions that I can ask? So that's the first step, is thinking about that broad question. Um, then I'm not going to talk about it today, but we would figure out how we can get our sample and how we can uh, enroll people into our study um, and get them to sign up for participation in an interview or a focus group. Um, then we would design, well, then we would decide, do we want to do focus groups with people or do we want to do interviews? What's the better option? Um, then we would take a lot of time to design our, folk, our interview protocol in our interview guide, which contains the questions. Um, we would re refine that by practicing and through some pilot testing, determine where we want to meet people, of course, obtain their informed consent, um, and then use good interview procedures and recording procedures. Um, so I'm going to talk very briefly about the differences between focus groups and interviews. Um, with interviews, we want to capture an in-depth look or a very nuanced look at one person's history or experiences or behaviors. Um, these are very good for sensitive topics um, when, you know, getting people in a group might not be appropriate. So in my own line of research, I do domestic violence research, and it's not usually appropriate to recruit and bring, let's say, 10 people together that are all survivors of domestic violence and ask them to share such, such sensitive information about themselves. Instead, that kind of research is better suited for a one-on-one -on -one interview. Um, on the other hand, sometimes we are really short on time and we need to get large groups of people to get as much data as we can quickly. Um, and so focus groups might be a good option for us. And we use focus groups when we're interested in interactions or data that might be stimulated from conversations among people. Um, and so really these are a good bang for your buck if you're short on time and if you w care about the group norms of something. So if I want to know how uh, nurses in the emergency department care for a certain kind of patient, it might be a great idea to get a bunch of them together and ask my questions to a big group of them. And so while interviews give us depth, focus groups can give us more breadth in a shorter period of time. Um, so just some rules of thumb, usually when we conduct interviews, 60 minutes is about as long as we want to keep participants for. That's really um, a, lo a long amount of time to ask someone to come and give up um, in their day. And you can really get a lot done in 60 minutes. Focus groups, though, we, we tend to want them to be a little bit longer if we have the time. Um, and that's because by the time you get a group of people together and you get everyone introduced and settled, you're already about 30 minutes in. And so in order to ask your questions and have enough time, we really do need an hour and a half or two hours. Um, in terms of the number of people for a focus group, six to eight is really the sweet spot. And you're encouraged to invite a few more people than you need. So if I knew I wanted to have eight people, I would invite maybe 10, because people always don't show up. They drop out. And so you'll still have your adequate number if you invite a few more people. Um, and when we do focus groups, we want people that we invite to be similar in some way. We have to be really mindful of power dynamics and hierarchies. And we, we, we don't want, um, for example, um, if we're studying like a research project and how uh, research projects getting off the ground. We don't want to have the director of that center or that project in with her research assistants. Um, people aren't going to be um, very forthcoming in that circumstance. Instead, we want people that are very similar to come together. Um, and people have their own different cultures. So doctors have a different culture and group dynamics than nurses. So if we wanted to know how doctors and nurses approached one issue, we might want to separate them so that people would feel more comfortable um, being around people that are most like themselves. Um, and I talked about this in the last focus or in the last presentation, but a very common question is, well, how many interviews do I need to do? How many focus groups do I need? There's really no answer um, other than you do them until saturation, which just means with every new interview or every new focus group you do, you're not hearing any new information. The themes that you heard before are coming up again and nothing else. Um, sometimes that can happen with as few as two to three focus groups and interviewing 10 individuals. It just depends on what your topic is and who you're speaking with. So there's no hard and fast rule, but looking in the literature about what other people do is a good starting point. Two other important things. Always, when you have focus groups, feed people and always pay people if you can. Um, not really necessary to feed a person that's coming for an interview, but 
having snacks on the table and drinks is really important for focus groups. Um, $25 per participant is pretty standard for focus groups and interviews. Longer or shorter, you might be able to adjust that a little bit. But these people are giving up um, their time and maybe sometimes traveling to you, so making sure to pay them an adequate amount is really critical. In terms of where we conduct focus groups and interviews, uh, we don't want to really ask people to come to our homes or come to our offices necessarily. Um, instead, we want to find some place that's public but that has a private area. Classrooms are really good. Libraries often have rooms that can be shut off. But in order to protect people's confidentiality and their privacy, we don't want to have an interview in the middle of Panera where it's busy and it's loud. And um, I've done focus groups before or interviews before in a person's home, and it was a nightmare because the UPS guy knocked on her door, her dog was going crazy, her phone rang 15 times, and my data wasn't great for that one, as opposed to the other people where we were in a private room. So it really does make a difference. Um, and we always want to be mindful of reducing the burden on our participants. Um, sometimes you don't have a choice but to make people travel um, longer distances, but if we can, it's really good to go to our participants. I did 10 interviews last summer um, with Rape Crisis Center employees in Kentucky, and they are spread out all over the state. And so I had to travel pretty much all over Kentucky, five hours one day, two hours the next. Um, but I couldn't have gotten the data in any other way. I, maybe by doing phone calls with them, um, but really having that face-to-face -face rapport is really important. So I had the budget to do it, and I chose to go out there and travel and meet them face-to-face. -face. And sometimes that creates longer-lasting connections and better data than just a phone call. Um, so one thing you want to be armed with anytime you're doing an interview or a focus group is what I call um, a protocol. So an interview focus an interview protocol can be used for both focus groups um, and individual one-on-one -on -one interviews. And really, this is just a packet of paper, maybe four to five pages, that tells you everything you're going to do, beginning to end, start to finish. Um, and so one important piece of paper to have is just the time, the date, where your interview's at, and then an opening statement that describes the purpose of the interview, much like I did with Mindy when I told her a little bit about myself and why I'm interested in the topic. And then you always want to have a consent script. The IRB might not require that you have participants sign a consent script, a consent form, and you can just get verbal consent. But either way, it's really important to talk through that with the participants. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Um, you want your interview guide with usually five to seven open-ended questions and some probes. Um, and then it's always helpful to have an interview checklist where it's pretty much everything you need to remember to bring batteries, um, your gift cards, name tags, consent forms, your demographic sheets, any papers you need to bring with you. And sometimes if multiple people are doing data collection, it's helpful to have a sheet that just says order of operations. Start out doing this. Turn on the recorder at this time. Um, that way, if maybe you have a group of five students doing interviews, they're all following the same procedures. Um, and so in, order of, in terms of the flow of this, um, of how a focus group might go and getting it set up, um, I really encourage people to practice, practice, practice their interview guide. Um, it's only five to seven questions, and you should be comfortable enough so that if someone, if you lost your interview guide, you could still conduct the interview. Because it's really difficult to be looking at someone face to face or running a focus group and constantly looking down and shuffling through papers. So with my interview guide, I like to have it all on one sheet of paper, not front and back, so that I can see everything. But I make sure that I go in and I have those questions in my head so that if I did not look down once, I could probably be OK. It's really hard, but it's important. Um, it's good to arrive early and set up if we can. Um, and then begin with greetings and introductions. Um, we don't want to just, hi, how are you? I'm going to start the recorder now. It's good to take a few minutes to just get to know your people and introduce yourself. Um, we begin with the purpose of the study, then go into the consent script. Maybe at that time, it's a nice time to turn on the audio recorder, making sure that they're OK with being recorded. Um, go through our interview guide qu and questions. If we're doing focus groups, we want someone else there to help us with taking notes. Um, and then we want to have like a nice strong closing where we take the time to thank our participants. Um, so in terms of a consent script, um, some people might just breeze through this pretty quickly because eh, they think, oh, my participants aren't interested in all this researchy stuff. But I have found when you take more time with the consent, 
you get better information. Um, and so to introduce why you're studying it, why their perspectives are important to you, why the data that they are sharing for one hour of their lives might impact other people and change people's lives can really um, get people to open up a little bit more. Um, you want to say, of course, who the investigators are in the study, that the procedures will involve maybe a short survey and a focus group or an interview. Um, and then I have confidentiality really asterisk there, and that's because I take the most time here. Um, and I always reassure participants, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in a focus group, it's very important to me that what is said in this room stays in this room. And I want you to know that I'm not going to leave here and go tell anybody what we talked about. And your answers and responses are not going to be associated with your name in any way. Um, any transcript we have is going to be completely de-identified. And so that's important for me to know or for me to tell you today. And so I take a moment and kind of get really serious on them right there, and you'll see them be like, oh, like she's protecting my uh, confidentiality. And so it, I think it really does make a difference to kind of take a moment to address that. Then you want to introduce, um, at that time, the audio recorder, and just tell them that it's easiest for you if you can record their responses today, and that's because you don't want to miss anything. Um, but again, assuring them how that will be protected. Um, then you want to tell them everything's voluntary, of course. They can skip any question they want. They don't have to answer all the questions. And even if they walk out the door in the middle of a focus group, they still get their gift card. Um, and then, of course, there are no known risks, but um, the information that they share might benefit other people. Then you check in and say, does that all sound OK? Are there any questions? Um, and if not, then you say, I'm going to go ahead and turn on the recorder. And then hopefully you have someone to help you or you know how to work your recorder. Um, and I have this, these pictures up here to show the recorders that I've used. Um, the one on the left here is from Amazon, and it's about $100. And it has a ton of bells and whistles that I don't even know how to use. Um, and I've used it successfully and unsuccessfully. Um, and I also have used an iPhone app, the audio recorder, the voice memos on iPhone. It's really, really easy to use. A lot of people use it. Um, so I think it's helpful to have two, have both. And then that way, if this doesn't work for you, you've at least got your backup. Um, the important thing here is just making sure to copy it to a secure location and deleting it from your phone quickly. So responsibilities um, of each people that might attend, or each person that might attend a focus group, um, usually want one moderator and at least one note taker. Um, so the moderator's responsibility is to make sure everybody's on track. They set the ground rules and they say, here's how it's going to go. Um, and they make sure that people are having a discussion in the way that they need them to have that discussion. That people aren't um, doing social loafing where they just sit back and don't participate at all. Um, or they're not dominating the conversation, which can happen. Um, and so the moderator has to be really effective at, well, thank you, Susan. You've provided a lot of really great information about that. I would really like to hear from Amy now. And so if you can get name tags, that's helpful sometimes so that you can call people by name. Um, note takers, though, are very critical in focus groups because they're capturing what your tape is not capturing. So the moderator is much too busy um, facilitating that discussion to capture interruptions or head nods or even the data that's coming out. The moderator is way too busy. Um, so anything nonverbal that's happening. So if everybody starts shaking their head at somebody's uh, response, that's not going to show up on the tape. So the note taker needs to get that down. Um, and then they can also help with those logistics of paperwork and um, setting up the voice recorder and even start jotting some preliminary themes that are emerging um, from the discussion. And so I just have here like an, uh, some examples of what note takers might, might write down from a focus group. They might show where people are sitting um, and then start for each key question jotting down some preliminary themes and some observations. And that's really helpful and can be incorporated later into the data. And so just a few uh, follow-up tips from some not-so-good experiences that I've had personally. Um, anytime you're doing an interview or a focus group, take two extra of every single thing. Um, I have had a recorder fail on me, um, so having that backup was really helpful. Um, if you have recorders, you need more batteries. Gift cards, have extra. Maybe you have seven people that are signed up for your focus group. I guarantee you people might bring their brother or mother or friend with them, and then you can't pay that person. But you really want their perspective. So taking extra is always important. 
Um, and then when you are checking your recordings, it's really helpful to, in the middle of the focus group, or maybe even before you get started, record it and then make sure you can hear yourself. Um, and at the very end, once everybody's gone, take a listen. Make sure that um, it picked up your voice and other people's voices. If the worst happens and you lose everything, which has happened before, um, then you just got to start taking notes like this little picture. And you just write down everything that you remember. And you might lose some um, great quotes, but you can hopefully get the main ideas and the main themes that emerge. So when I did those interviews in Kentucky last summer, I did four interviews in one day. And I, I took two recorders, and I used the recorder that I hadn't tested yet. Um, and it ended up picking up the audio so softly that even with headphones, I couldn't hear myself or the people I interviewed. Um, and thank goodness there's some program out there that I was able to use and download that could pick up the audio. And my transcriptionist helped me figure it out. But if I wouldn't have, and, and I didn't check the audio. I just drove back to West Virginia, didn't even check it, and then months later put, plug in my audio and it's gone. So anything I learned from those interviews was way out of my memory by that time. So right after the fact, it's good to take tons and tons of notes. Because as each day passes, you forget what you, forget what you talked about. Um, so now I'm going to switch gears into talking about crafting interview questions um, and actually the process of interviewing for a few minutes. Does anyone have any questions about the logistics of focus groups and interviews? OK. All right, so we have some rules for how we want to craft our questions and how we want to actually conduct interviews and focus groups with qualitative research. Um, we almost always use an open-ended style. Um, we avoid leading questions. And then when we craft our questions, we make probes so that we can develop, we can probe issues in depth and get a lot of detail. Um, and then we try to let the informant or the participant lead the interview. We want to talk very little and have the other people guide us and where they're going to take the discussion. Um, so there's d different types of questions that we can use with our interview guides that we create. Um, experience and behavior questions are very common. Um, asking people what, you know, to describe what it would look like if you followed them throughout the day is very common. Uh, asking people what they think and their values and their opinions. Um, asking feeling questions, like how do you feel about something? And if you use that kind of question, then you don't want the person's response to be, well, I think that, da, da, da. You want it to be, I feel happy about it. I feel worried about it. You want an adjective to be their response. Um, we can ask knowledge questions in qualitative work. It doesn't have to be simply, how do you feel? But we can ask, well, can you tell me about your organization's policy about something? Um, to really almost quiz people to see if they have accurate knowledge of something. Um, we can ask sensory questions about what people see and hear um, in a certain situation. Um, and then lastly, we can use demographics and background questions in qualitative work. But instead of asking yes or no questions, we might want to ask something open-ended. And so I have a picture of Tiger Woods up here because he's a good example of someone who, when he is asked um, how he defines his race, he says that he is a Coblin Asian. So Caucasian, Black, American Indian, and Asian. And if we were to give Tiger Woods a survey that had the typical you know, white, African-American, Asian Pacific Islander, he might check many of them or he might check other. And we wouldn't accurately capture his race. So it's really important when we ask demographic questions in qualitative work to be open-ended and ask how people describe themselves or define themselves. So asking good questions and doing it the right way is really a skill and an art that can be learned. Um, we always want to have open-ended, neutral, singular, and clear questions. Just like in survey development and in quantitative work, we want to follow much those same rules, except for the open-endedness. We want open-ended questions. Um, so typically, a way to know if you're asking the good kind of questions are if they begin with um, who, what, where, when, and how. We can use why questions, but we want to be really careful about how we do that. So if we would ask someone, why did you come to the emergency department today? Or why didn't you bring your child in when they first started developing symptoms? That kind of implies some judgment um, and that maybe there's a right answer. Um, so really asking instead, um, how would you describe your experience? Um, and what did you do when your child first uh, displayed symptoms? Might be a better way to do that. Um, and so with typical surveys, we might ask people, 
we want to rate someone's satisfaction with something, we might say, how satisfied are you? And then give them answer choices, like a Likert scale. Um, well, maybe you're going to take that and say, well, how can I turn that into a qualitative question? So you might put how in front of it and say, how satisfied are you? But really, that's not open-ended because we're still asking someone about their satisfaction when maybe they're not satisfied at all or that's not where they would go in their heads with this question. So um, instead, to be truly open, we want to say, how do you feel about something? What is your opinion of something? And then if they want to talk about satisfaction, that's great. Um, but this already kind of leads them. Um, so dichotomous questions, you guys picked that up right off the bat with my first example, my first bad interview role play. So anything that can be answered with a yes or no or a one word answer, we want to avoid if we can. Um, do you know something? Anything that begins with do is usually a bad question for qualitative work. Um, we want to avoid those leading questions. Um, leading questions are those that tell the people we want a certain answer from them. So if someone said, Danielle, what fears do you have about the tenure process? Um, even though I do have fears about that process, if I didn't, your question just made me think that I should. So I'm going to start talking about fears when maybe I don't even have them. Um, how good was your treatment? Well, maybe it wasn't good at all. So we're really leading people in the wrong direction if we word questions like this. And instead, we want things to be, how do you feel about this? Um, what do you do? Um, how do you feel about um, the treatment you received? Really neutral, um, non-biased questions. Um, and so being neutral doesn't mean, though, that we're, when we're interviewing people, we are robots and that we sit there and we're like, okay, 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 understood. We don't have to be robots when we interview people. We can be human and express our emotions. We just want to make sure our relationship with the data that's coming through remains neutral. Um, not like, oh, I agree completely with you. We're on the same page about that. No, we, we don't want to say that because then they're only going to continue giving us data that is similar to what they've already said. Um, so social desirability is real in qualitative interviewing. If you take someone down a path with the way you ask your questions, they will give you the information they want you to hear. Um, it's very real in surveys, and it's even more of a threat with qualitative interviewing, right? They're meeting a stranger they've never seen in their whole life, and then the person's asking them personal experiences and things. They don't want to come across um, to, you know, in a negative way at all. So they will tell you what you want to hear. So being neutral is really important. Um, in terms of singular questions, just like in survey design, we want, our, we want questions that just are about one singular thing. So not what are the barriers and challenges and um, facilitators, or what do you like and dislike? We want to ask questions separately. So this is an example that's in um, a popular qualitative textbook when someone was doing some interviews with people about an intervention program um, and they saw the transcript afterwards. It said, to help the staff improve the program, we'd like to ask you to talk about your opinion. Uh, what do you think are the strengths and weaknesses? What do you like? What you don't like? What do you think could be improved or stay the same? Those kinds of things. And any other comments you have. So this is a terrible question. This is so easy to do. And when I have read transcripts of me doing focus groups and interviews, I've done this. It's very, very easy to throw it all at them, but that's very overwhelming for a participant. They don't even know where to begin. So it's much better to say, I'm going to talk about um, a variety of uh, things about your experience. We're going to start with um, your strengths, the strengths of this program. Then once they give you some data, you say, OK, now let's move to weaknesses. And then you go through your questions. But when we throw out one of those big, long-winded uh, questions at people, it's very, very overwhelming. Very hard habit to break, and I'm guilty of it. We also want our questions to be clear. Um, we want to make sure we're using the participant's language. So in my research, um, academically and in the literature, we call domestic violence intimate partner violence many times. But I'm not going to go interview um, survivors of uh, domestic violence and say, let's talk about your intimate partner violence. They call it domestic violence, or maybe they call it abuse. I'm going to use their language. And so I always ask up front how people refer to key terms, and then I use that language. Um, so when you're crafting your interview guide, it's really important to just start writing down the main themes and areas that you want to you wanna get at. And then underneath each area, you can start writing sub-questions for each thing. 
um, then adjust the language, and then develop probes, which I'm going to talk about here very quickly. Um, when you sequence your questions, it's important to start out with something really non-controversial and a gimme question. So, what are you working on in school, or how's work going? Tell me about that. Something that's really easy for them to answer. Um, and never begin with a bunch of yes or no demographics. Kind of space them out through the, question, through the questionnaire. Um, and so, figuring out ways to make your interview guide flow takes a lot of time. You can adjust it later. Just because you had questions in one order at the beginning doesn't mean that if it didn't work, you can't change it. You always can. Um, anything difficult or sensitive should be asked at the end, once rapport has been established. Um, and then at the very end of interviews, you want to really close strongly and, say, and make the person feel better for having talked to you versus saying, well, thanks very much and I'll see you later and kind of shuffling out the door. Um, so probes are really important. I'm running short on time, so I'm not going to talk in depth about these. But this is just a way to get people to tell you more detail. So instead of just one, a one-line response or a one-word response, they really describe a lot of information. So Mindy told me a whole lot about Spice, and, and, and she told me stories about how you know, she interacts with Spice. And that's really what I wanted versus Spice makes me happy, right? That's not good, rich data. Um, and so the way you can craft probes are to just have your question. So here's one I have from the past that says, can you share your experiences with screening clients for domestic violence? Probe um, for when that occurs in a home visitation schedule or when, what screening form is used to do this? What kinds of questions are asked, right? So I don't have to have questions for each of those. I hope my participants will cover that. And if they don't, I know that I need to ask that. So probes are really key. Um, it helps us get more detail and elaboration from our participants. We just ask people, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Would you share some more detail about that? And that's just a way to get more, more detail. We can clarify with probes if we're not understanding what participants are saying, just by saying, could you elaborate that? Or you mentioned that the program was a success. What do you mean by success? Um, and really with interviewing, we teach people what we're looking for. Um, we can do that with head nods and with um, leaning forward sometimes and saying, that's really exactly what we're looking for. Can you share more about that? Um, if people are going way off topic, though, and not giving you any information you need, don't shake your head yes and say, that's really helpful information. Just be a little bit more silent, and maybe they'll redirect the conversation. Um, and so, as I said, we can lean forward and we can use silence. Don't be afraid to embrace the silence of an interview and let it be awkward. If the interviewee tries to fill that silence, then the transcript is going to be more of the interviewer talking than um, the participant. And so, just quickly, some tips and some troubleshooting. If a question causes discomfort and you ask it and you can tell the participant has no idea what you mean or you, you can visually tell that you've made them upset, you can reframe it or you can always move on. Um, you don't have to stick to a question if the person is just not getting it. And that's okay. Sometimes that happens and then later on you know that you need to go figure out a better way to ask that. Um, but if people are really on a roll and they're just breezing through some of your interview questions, but one that you put right in the middle of your interview guide they skipped, that's okay. Let them keep talking. Let them answer as much as they want to, and then you can always follow up with that. So keeping notes and jotting down what's been talked about and what hasn't is really helpful. And then at the end, that member checking that I did with Mindy at the end of the second interview is something we always want to do. It really just lends credibility to our findings. Um, so the respondents will know if we are uncomfortable or uneasy. Um, so practice a lot and just be uh, well informed about what your interview guide said. Um, be really excited that they're there to speak with you. Um, I always like to establish that cultural ignorance that says, I don't know anything about this topic or I only know my own perspective. You're here to teach me about your perspective. And then that kind of puts the power back with the participants. Because a lot of times, you know, we're in academia, a lot of the people we interview um, are not like us. And they think, oh, someone up from the university in a big business suit is going to come and talk to me. What if I answer wrong? It is very common. And so dressing in plain clothes sometimes helps. Um, just making yourself more as I'm here to learn from you instead of I'm, there's a right or wrong answer and I'm looking to see if you're going to tell me what I want to hear. 
Um, once you get your transcripts back, you should see, you know, the interviewer's question and then a whole bunch of text from your participants and then another question and a whole bunch of text. You don't want the interviewer to be talking most of the time. Um, so my take home advice really is that when you're crafting interview guides, when you're thinking about doing focus groups and interviews, um, think about what you want to say at the end of the day. What would you love to be able to describe um, to people who might read your paper or if you gave a presentation on data that you collected? And then simply craft questions that will help you get at that information. Um, despite the title of the talk being talking about asking the right questions, there aren't right or wrong questions in qualitative interviewing. There are just ways to um, design your questions and ask them verbally that will elicit better responses. Um, and I view interviews and focus groups as just friendly conversations with people um, that have some information that you want to learn more about. And so that's kind of the way I um, approach it. And then it's much less daunting for both the interviewer and the interviewee. Um, and I just wanted to plug this uh, research methods guide. It's a data collector's field guide for um, doing all kinds of qualitative research. It is at a very basic level, so anybody could pick it up and run a successful focus group or interview after reading it. So I highly recommend this. Um, and that is all I have. So I think we have the room until one, so if anybody has questions, I am happy to answer them. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. I'm happy to, my contact information's up here if anybody thinks of anything um, down the road that you want to talk about.